Welcome to The Struggle is Real, a show for 20-somethings that are trying to figure out adulting. I'm your host, Justin Peters. Each episode, we focus on solving a problem that we will face throughout this defining decade that wasn't covered in the classroom. This could include topics about our career, health, relationships, and money. Let's get into it. I don't want to waste any time on a preamble, so let's get straight into the guest bio today. The amazing Brian Bogart is joining me on the podcast today. At seven years old, his life transformed in a blink of an eye after he was in a vehicle accident and his left arm was detached, literally detached on the floor. He will talk about that whole story about halfway through this conversation. But instead of dwelling in the suffering, he fully recovered and flourished with a retached arm thanks to his persistent and proactive focus. Today, Brian is a lot of things. Entrepreneur, coach, speaker, business strategist, author, and philanthropist. But he would say his two most important titles are husband and father. It took chasing traditional success for him to realize this, though. At 27, Brian had it all on paper. He helped grow a risk management firm from a quarter million dollars to over $15 million. He had an abundance of money, a nice house, and a cool car. But after being absent from the first six months of his baby's life, he put an end to chasing traditional success. He stopped the era of what to begin the era of who. The people in his life have now become his focus. Aside from being an enjoyable speaker to listen to, and I mean like really enjoyable, Kyle was obsessing over how flawless his transcripts were. You'll have many takeaways from this episode, including understanding the critical questions in your life, how to focus less on what and more on who, and how to embrace pain to avoid suffering. We also get into a really interesting discussion about anger near the end of the conversation, so I would stay tuned to listen to that if that's something that might resonate with you. If you don't want to miss an episode, hit the follow button. And if you're a fan of the show, I'd love it if you left a rating and review. Let's get into it. I hope you enjoy my conversation with someone described as the male Brené Brown and the wordsmith king himself, Brian Bogart. Brian, thanks for coming on The Struggle is Real. Excited for this conversation. You're somebody that I met, I believe, a month or two ago. We got introduced through a mutual connection, and I immediately resonated with a lot of your content, your story, everything that you're sharing out there. You're a, a guy that I feel like pulls in a lot of positive energy. So excited for this conversation and to dive into your story a little bit. And we will get to that that story here in a second. But let's start with actually something that's behind you. I can see it's still there, the Nike shoe with the orange highlights. Tell me a little bit about that shoe and why it's placed behind you. This shoe was a shoe that my wife designed in spirit of our company. And she did it last year. And you know, our brand colors, those, these, these aren't the exact colors. It's a blue and orange. And I've always liked bright colors. And I've also always liked like the classic style gum type soles and shoes. Yep. And so when she designed these, she obviously was doing it for the benefit of the company, but the really special touch that she did, and I doubt it'll be even be seen on camera, but on the inside of the tongue, the word B is written. And the, re the reason the word B is written is because one of my first coaches gave me a tagline that I use often, and it's one of the ways that I center myself, it's be where your feet are. It's for me, one of those visual checks that I can look down, see where my feet are and calibrate and know that this is exactly the moment, the place and who and where and how I'm supposed to be existing. And so the more I can center myself in the moment, the more I can just be, the more I am. And so it was just a really special thing. What's funny about the reason they're on the shelf is my normal size was like about a size too big. <laughs> and so we decided we'd just order another pair that would fit. So I wear these shoes on stage, but it seemed really fitting that because everything behind me is curated with intentionality, that this has a place up there as well. So I love that question. Yeah. And I also, I love how intentional you are and how well you think about the environment, both from a physical standpoint, a mental standpoint, a lot of different aspects, just like those shoes. I believe, I didn't hear you say, but I believe you wear them every time you go out and do a, a speaking engagement as well. Yeah, I wear them every time I'm on stage. Mm -hmm. That's that's so cool. And you have other things about you as well. You have your tattoo, it's the three words. I think it's like trust, surrender, breathe that you have. That is a consistent reminder for you as well, an actual physical reminder on your body. <laughs> and then joking aside too, you also have like this trust stash, I believe you and your business partner calls it. I think that's more as a, an inside joke, but also you kind of embody that in a sense as well. And you've really kind of embraced that piece. <laughs> when did the intentionality, all of this intentionality, was this always something that you have done or has this recently come up in your life? I would tell you that I have always been very intentional, but I've been even more intentional about being intentional in the last few years. You know, the reality of it is, is 
I don't believe that we can be intentional with anything that we lack awareness around. So, so much of what I talk about, as you know, is this first step of really understanding how do we raise our level of awareness. And so I've only been able to be as intentional as my awareness would have allowed in prior periods in my life. And so I pride myself on the fact that intentionality is something that I do deploy and operate in, in so many areas of my life and have for a long time. But it's those areas where I've been blind and I've lacked intention that I now have had the opportunity to start shedding additional layers in my life to get more clear on those pieces. And the more I align with intentionality in who I am, I mean, every single thing on the, that shelf has a reason that it's there. Every single piece in how I approach elements, and there's a lot of stuff that for our insiders, they know that I've got little embedded pieces baked in as well. There's a time set on that clock, which matches the exact same time on the pocket watch that's tattooed on the bottom of my arm. There's a level of intention to almost everything I do and I believe that it's with intention that we start to create influence and in living authentically with the core of who we are and allowing that to amplify who we are into the world so that we can really reach and impact those who we want to impact. And so for me, intentionality is just a way of existing at this point, but I'm consistently looking for ways to take it deeper. That's interesting. And I've heard intentionality come up a couple of times on this podcast, everything from the sticky notes on the bathroom mirror to, you know, other people wearing very specific things like your shoes whenever they go out and, and do something that they want to bring some real intention to. Is there something that comes up recently that an area of your life that you wanted to put more attention to that you taken this or done one of these, you know, things to bring in some of that awareness? Yeah, with my son, a lot with my son recently. You know, I... My son is probably the most similar to me in our household. He's also the most different in some ways, which is really fascinating because we just, we really do understand each other with how we vibrate, how we think, how we operate. But because of the familiarity, there's also blocking points, right? Because where we are insecure in ourselves, we project into others. And so with my son in particular, there are certain things and patterns that have developed as he's grown that. I recognize were hurdles, challenges for me in different ways. Maybe not the exact same way he experiences it, but a lot of my past with my son, I think has been through a lens of me trying to protect him, but protect him in ways that maybe he didn't want to be protected. And so even as young as eight years old, it's something as simple as recognizing that we are only going to have impact and influence when someone is open and willing to receive what we're giving to them. Hmm. And there were patterns in how I interacted with him early that would have caused him to be hesitant or to be a little more reserved with me in moments. And so I've been very, very intentional investing in our relationship and resetting some of those patterns that have been developed and taking ownership real time to establish a different level of trust in the way that we engage and interact so that he can really feel confident knowing that like, what dad says is also what dad means and that dad genuinely wants what's best for him. But a great example of how this came together is, right? I know because I know him so well, what he desires. And this isn't like me projecting on him what I think he desires. This is legitimately, I have a good understanding. And so I have given feedback to my son in athletic type environments on the field, whether it be soccer or football or you name it, through the lens of helping him grow in the areas that I know he desires. Yet that still has been faced with some level of resistance, even though it has nothing to do with me. And he knows that. He knows that. He's even said that to me. But about three or four weeks ago, something clicked. And after watching him in practice, he came up to me. And for whatever reason, despite the fact that I asked for permission to give feedback to everyone in my life, I don't always with my kids, mm. right? There's almost an expectation that an apparent and, and minor that they are willing to receive feedback. But at the same time, I want to make sure that he actually receives it and processes it, that it's not something that's being pounded into him. And so I paused for just a second. And I said, hey, buddy, dude, I'm watching everything that you're doing. And I love how you're approaching these things. I see a couple of areas that I think you might benefit from an awareness moment that might take you further down where I think you want to go. If dad has any of that that he wants to contribute to you, do you want me to share it? Or do you just want me to cheer from the sidelines? What was his response? He said the second. 
But I will tell you that in the pattern of a bunch of intentionality building over the course of the last few months, like that was a critical moment that opened up a pathway into our relationship that I hadn't yet experienced. Mm. And there's a safety that he now has with me, I believe, from an emotional perspective that despite the fact that I've held him in so many trying moments and I've always kept him safe and protected, there was a block and a gap there because I didn't understand that my attempts to help him down his path even though he knew they were down his path and not for my own benefit, were not being received in a way that was beneficial. It was actually creating resistance and energy drain in his world. So if I was the source of that, how did I create the repair and how did I remove that? And I will tell you, literally just two nights ago, my son said, dad, I like love the work that we've put in our relationship. I feel way more connected with you. I feel like we can communicate more together. And I feel like we're seeing and understanding each other in a way that we haven't. My son's eight. Those are the words he used. And so this was a gap for me because I knew what was possible there, but I also knew that I was the only one that could create that path. And so I've struggled to find that intentional window to create the path because of the past of our histories. So you see dad is right there, right? Dad is absolutely one of my absolute number one roles and priorities. And so if there's a gap in my own home, I need to close those gaps because that's the only thing binary in my world. My wife and my kids aren't good. You've heard me say this before. I'll walk away from everything else we're doing. And the reality of it is my son has had a trying couple of years because of a whole variety of reasons that have nothing to do with our household. But I'm still the one that can be the protector and connector for him. And that was the gap that I needed to close. That resonated with me a lot. I'm, I have a relationship in my life like that currently too. My little brother just moved to Austin and is going through a transition period in his own life. And I often catch myself projecting what I think he should be doing onto him without really asking if he is open to and or would even like to receive any of this advice as well. And I feel like that's really hard. That would challenge me as a parent for sure. I'm not a parent, but I as you kind of mentioned, it's almost like it, it's, it's almost like a given that you should be allowed to give your kids advice. So to take a step back like that, and also to receive the feedback from your, your son that I just want you to be cheerleader right now on the sidelines probably was really hurtful, but then you got the payoff one month later, whenever he did approach you. I'll tell you, it actually wasn't hurtful at all. It was clear, mm-hmm. right? Like it allowed me to just sit in that role and be his champion and his cheerleader. And I, it, it allowed me to recognize where and how he wanted me to serve. And because it's never been about me in that dynamic, like that was easy for me to receive. You know, in fact, it was more about me beating myself up for the blind spot that I had and not previously asking him for the same permission. But no, it actually allowed me to completely drop my own armor around that whole area and needing to protect him as well and just really cheer for him because he thrived in that space. And so since that point, every single practice, every single game, every single everything, I literally since that point have reserved any feedback and I'm just cheer. And I'll tell you that one shift, as minuscule as it might seem, was so profound as it relates to our relationship. But I, it got me thinking too. I mean, I really just created a piece of content around this not that long ago. Is it's like feedback really is permission-based, but there's really a couple of categories that we don't often view it that way, right? It's often like our kids. It's often our spouses. But more often than not, what's crazy is because it's a transactional relationship as leaders and businesses... How often do we just expect that feedback is inherent and expected as a part of the relationship? The reality of it is, is that, yes, we have the right as an employer, as a parent, as a spouse to share feedback. However, what is our goal and our intent? Because if we enter into it wanting the best outcome, then how do we create the environment for the best conversation possible? And I would argue that even if you've established the ability to give feedback because of the hierarchy or perceived hierarchy of the relationship, that asking for permission still opens the recipient in a way that they'll hear you differently than they would have otherwise, which will lead to a more productive conversation. And so this is something too that I took intentionality with my son and something that I've applied externally in my world, but it gave me a deeper understanding on how do I apply it into every conversation in every relationship so that I can continue to make sure I provide that safe space for everyone, regardless of my perceived ability to give feedback. So how does that differ with your wife, Ashley? She joined the business and now is a business partner of yours. And it was actually, it sounded like the flip with her where you weren't giving enough specific feedback. It was this like open loop of like, yeah, babe, you go do whatever you want to do. Like I, I, I trust you. And she heard that and was like, 
he doesn't know where I'm valuable or, or like he's, yeah. I, I, he's, she's not, he's not giving me anything specific here. I think it's important to separate because I really think that this is a very different situation. Okay. And I want to be clear on what I mean by that. Feedback as I'm receiving it is feedback that might be received as criticism, even if it's coming from a place of good intent to help someone develop around a pattern, a blind spot, a tactic, something that they're deploying. So when I talk about feedback, right, with a team, it might be, hey, you were working on this project and there's a blind spot here, right? And I want to be able to coach them through it, but do it in a way that it's not received as critical because I don't believe that what they did was bad. In my wife's case, what she was looking for was direction and leadership, mm -hmm. which was different than feedback. Right. And that's where the gap came in my wife is that I believed that by giving her what I perceived she wanted, which was freedom, autonomy, the ability to define her own path actually created an area where she felt unsafe and it caused her to spin because of my lack of ability to articulate where I saw her value in the business. Now, it's not that where I saw her value is where her value is, but that's what she was asking me. I just didn't hear that in the question she was asking. Right. And so I think it's an important distinction because feedback and permission based feedback is very different than the scenario. However, it's an important one where we still need to make sure because I could have asked an additional question when she asked me what she could do in the business instead of responding. Well, with whatever you want, I could have leaned in and said, are you wanting me to point you into a direction? Do you have a desired path? Are you asking me to tell you where I believe you've had the greatest amount of impact in the business? I could have qualified further than creating just this ambiguous space of openness. And what was interesting is it was that moment with my wife that I started to realize that what we all seek and desire around this idea of freedom, we all want to be free. Everybody, you ask anybody and they're like, what do you want? Oh, I want freedom, financial freedom, love freedom, whatever it is, right? Whatever freedom it is, there's some element of freedom that we desire, right? It was this moment with my wife where I started to realize two things. One, freedom is what we all desire, but it's like the scariest place to be. Do you know what happens when a plane flies in parabolic flight? No idea. Okay, so a parabolic flight, right? Literally this, okay? Okay. And the reason a plane flies in parabolic flight is to create weightlessness for the passengers. Mm. Weightlessness, as I see it, is defined as freedom. What's interesting is the weightlessness doesn't happen in the poles. It happens in the middle. It happens in between the curves, Right? And so what's fascinating is I look at this and I'm like, we are all afraid of freedom because everything in this world is polarized and politicized. We're forced to pick from one side to the other, right? And so what do we do? We put ourselves into camps of people that think like us, operate like us so that we can feel safe, even if we know at our heart that we don't align completely. But it's this idea of polarization, politicization, because, oh, by the way, if I'm anchoring to something or somebody or some belief system, then I'm safe. When we realize that weightlessness happens in between the poles, what we all seek and desire is freedom, but it's the scariest place to be because we don't have anything to anchor to. So what I just want everybody to understand, and this is what I was realizing with my wife, is that the reason it's the scariest place to be is because there isn't a strong enough anchor in you. And so the reality of it is, is we have the ability to be the anchor, but as leaders in life and in business, and in this case, I needed to be the anchor until she could find her own in the business. So the freedom I was giving her was actually like drowning in the middle of an ocean because she had nothing to grab onto to save her life. All she wanted was a life raft to just say, just give me something to float on until I understand where I'm going to swim myself, yeah. right? And I didn't give that to her because I didn't recognize that that's what she needed. Again, I'm really clear, dude. I've got so many blind spots. There's so many things that I continue to learn and develop on, but this is one of them, right? My wife, I gave ambiguity. I gave freedom because I believe that's what she wanted. What she really wanted was me to tell her, this is where I see all the value. And this is where I see the greatest amount of impact when you show up in the business, because that she could anchor to and that she could live within until she could define her own rhythm. So thank you for that question. I, I thank you for also letting me separate the two, but they're different, right? Feedback is different than leadership and direction. Both are important and both tie us as the protector and the connector in those environments. But the way they're nuanced is important to understand. Yeah. And one thing that I picked up in there and that I've learned through a varying different amount of guests that I've had on the show too, is sometimes following up with a question is way more important than following up with your opinion or your advice. Oh, you know, yeah. I, I've routinely like been like, okay, I need before, before I just spew, I need to take a step back and try to collect as much information as possible here because I am seeing it from my own lens and I'm playing, I'm playing in player one. And it is very hard sometimes to look at what you know third player is coming from where they're coming from this angle too and you're right i found that 
whenever you guys were talking about the story of when you told your wife that, yeah, do whatever you want. Like for me, I was like, heck yeah, like that sounds awesome. Like he's just giving me freedom to go, you know, yeah. go solve problems throughout the organization. But once again, it only took one or two maybe follow-up questions to realize that wasn't what she was exactly asking for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, again, we all have those blind spots. And I think those that are closest to us are the ones we have got the biggest blind spots with. And so with my wife and my journey, right, this is the first time that we've been in business together. Though she's been my partner in life for going on 16 years, I've been an entrepreneur for most of that time. In the last 12 to 18 months is the first time she's ever wanted to be involved in the business. Yeah. So we are now going down this new path as business partners and recognizing that we're wearing different hats. It means we're learning new skill sets and new deeper ways of understanding each other in different ways that we can communicate and connect. And so you know, I, again, I, I, I'm far from having it all figured out. I don't know what I don't know. I just try to raise my level of awareness, like I said, so I can be a little more intentional in everything I do. <laughs> have you guys made any rules around separating business and family time? Is there a specific time you guys can discuss certain things? And is there a certain time you can't discuss, you know, business matters? You know, for example, like at the dinner table or something? <laughs> yeah, and it's not like hard and fast at the moment, but there's a couple that are, are pretty hard and fast. The one that I would tell you that in rare exception, this gets broken, but we are very disciplined on at this point. We don't talk about business when we're in bed, period. If we are in our bed, that is the time for us to be connecting with each other, having conversations, watching a show, listening to something, whatever. We don't talk business unless it is absolutely essential. And there have been times that we've done that, but it's mutually agreed upon that we do so. And so that's kind of like the barrier, whereas the second we're in bed, no business talk. I traditionally try to honor the fact that she is in, you know, mom mode and every other mode in the morning. And so I'm a morning person. It's easy for me to get up and going because I'm up at 4.30 every day. And by the time she's awake, I've already got 50 things that's going and I could like dump on her if I'm not careful. Though it's not a hard and fast rule, it is a boundary I try to respect, which is to not talk to her about business until the kids are out of the door whether I'm taking them or she is, right? It doesn't matter which, but like giving that space in the morning for her to get her day going. Outside of that, like we try to protect dinner and bedtime with the kids a lot. I typically leave my primary phone in my office casita when I come inside at night until the kids go to bed and I do my roundup. So I have an, at least 90 minutes of really intentional disconnected electronic time so that I'm just very present with them. Those are the ways that we try to set our rhythm. Outside of that, because we communicate so freely about it, We've got a pretty like open flow. You know, if she knows I have to get stuff done on the weekend, she'll even say, hey, where are two hours that we can find for you to get this done so you can be very present with us the rest of the time, right? We are consistently looking for ways to do it, but really the only hard and fast rule is no business in bed. Hey, this is Justin Peters from the Struggles Real Team. I hope you're enjoying the show. We're going to get right back to it after a quick message. I have so much fun interviewing the guests that come on The Struggle is Real, and I try to squeeze out as much knowledge as I can. But as much as I'd love to talk to them all day, we only have a limited amount of time. Luckily, so many of my guests have condensed all of their wisdom into a book. So if you've resonated with a guest on the show, I encourage you to go check out their book. These books are incredible, and I think they add a ton of value. I have all the guest books in one easy to find place. Just head over to justinpeters.co forward slash books. By purchasing books through the links on our website, you're also supporting the show. So thank you for that, as that is how we continue to expand The Struggle is Real. Now back to the episode. So let's shift the conversation. We're 25 minutes in now, and we have yet to bring up the truck accident. So can you share in, in as much detail as you would like what happened on the events of August 10th, 1992? Yeah, absolutely. August 10th, 1992, 6, 10 p.m. My mom, my brother, and I had gone to our local Walmart to just get a one-inch paintbrush. Anybody who's known me for more than a couple of minutes, and you've known this just by talking with me in the time, like I've got a lot of energy. I talk fast. I walk fast. I've got an excitement for life. And, you know, it was no different back then. I was excited to get back to the car, get home, and put that paintbrush to use. So I was the first one there. My mom and brother were a few feet behind. And this was back in the days before there was key fobs. So I had to wait for mom to literally reach into her purse, grab the keys, stick it in the door and turn the key so we'd go on their way. And as all of that was happening, there was a truck that pulled up in front of the store, parked, and the driver and middle passenger got out. Passenger all the way to the right felt the truck moving backwards. So Justin, he did what any one of us would do. He scooted over, put his foot on the brake, but he instead hit the gas. 
And I'll tell you over this last year, it's been interesting because I used to like think about that. So like laissez-faire, like, oh, just scoot over, put my foot on the brake and like, it's good to go. But then I started to realize like if I was in a truck moving backwards when I wasn't in the driver's seat and I was the passenger, I would probably have a sense of panic, hurry. And I would be like rushing to raise that knee up as high as I could and slam it on that brake pedal. And I'm confident that's what happened because when he missed the brake and he hit the gas, all that force went in the gas pedal and he catapulted up onto the steering wheel up on the dashboard. And before you know it, he was catapulting 40 miles an hour across the parking lot right at us with no time to react. I was standing in my mom's car. We believe my hand was on the handle and he goes up and over the median, hits the tree in the median, hits our car, pushes it out of the way, throws me to the ground, runs over me diagonally, tearing my spleen, leaving a tire track scar on my stomach and continuing on to completely sever my left arm from my body. So 115 degree day, mom and brother watch the whole thing happen. They look down, they see me on the pavement. They look up and they see my arm 10 feet away. I always, whenever I tell this story, have to honor the woman that is responsible for me even being here with you today. There was a nurse that walked out of the store right when this took place. She saw the literal life and limb scenario in front of her. And I'm forever indebted to this woman for her choice to go into action versus go on with her day. How many times does it happen the other way? She came over and she stopped the bleeding on the main wound, saved my life. She instructed some innocent bystanders to run inside, grab a cooler, fill it with ice and get my detached limb on ice within minutes, give me a fighting chance of having a reattached arm. So if it wasn't for this woman, I would either wouldn't be here with you today or I'd be here with you today with a cleaned up stump. That's just the reality. I know that you did research and you knew where this story was going. Yeah. But I know that a lot of your listeners probably didn't, even with the end bed of the truck accident. But what I do know is that, yes, I have a shocking story. Yes, I have a unique story. But what I've also realized in all my time of doing this, brother, is that every single one of us has a unique story. Every single one of us, regardless of the extremities of our stories, we all have them. Yes. What's important is that we pause and become aware of the lessons we can extract from those stories and then become intentional with how do we apply them in our lives. And I believe that it's our ability to do that that really puts us in the best situation to see who we are most clearly so we can move faster with less effort. And a couple of the core primary lessons came directly from this. And so I'm sure we'll unpack a couple of them today, but that's the story. And that was really kind of the beginning of uh, life as I know it, uh, which ironically enough is coming up on its 30 year anniversary here in a few days. Wow, are you doing anything special to celebrate? You know, it's interesting. Like, it's funny. I love that you appreciated the celebration because that's truly what it is for me every year. It's not like a remorse. It's not a, it's not a reflection from a negative standpoint. We have some things that we're doing this month that we're pretty excited about. We're going to be launching some stuff through the business that I'm pretty excited about later this month on the actual 10th this year. I don't have an exact plan, but I'm going to be highly present. And it's been a very interesting path of like healing and connected circles in my life for the last 18 months that's coming full circle. And so I'm going to be with my family on the 10th where I possibly can be to honor those that really are the reason that I'm here today. So many of those people exist in my world, but my family is absolutely the short list of ones that I would not be on this planet without. Last I heard, you were on a quest to find the nurse to eventually thank her. Have you Any leads, any connections there? Nothing? Nothing. I keep putting it out there. I've continued to kind of trace down based on the names and the connections, and I've continued to come up empty. Wow. That's so surprising that nobody has, you know, because this is not a story that you forget. I mean, if you're the nurse, you remember that it only takes a little bit of murmur throughout, you know, this community to probably find out who that is. But, you know, clearly, clearly an angel. Here's the reality, though. Like, if the person doesn't want to be found, I respect that as well. Right. And so there's an element of this where it's like, as much as selfishly, I would love that connection and the opportunity to just say, thank you. Like truly that's, I have, I want nothing from this person. I just genuinely want them to know the impact of that one decision and the ripple effect of what that's going to mean for the next few decades, because I am very committed on this path that we're on right now. But at the same time, just like feedback is permission-based, If she doesn't want that connection, if she doesn't want the remembrance, I mean, there was likely trauma that she experienced through that in some way. If she doesn't want to be found, I a thousand percent support and respect that because it's not about me as as much as I selfishly would love the connection. It's really about honoring her. That makes sense. So you talked about lessons learned through this accident as well. Let's talk about one of those lessons. And it actually came through the bedmate that you were next to after the accident happened. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah. You know, at seven years old, there's a lot of people that like are surprised that you can have like feelings of like remorse and fear moving into the forward and, you know, the question, why me? 
so many people have like questioned, they're like, really at seven, you were thinking that way? Yeah, no, I was because I had to get a healthy relationship with mortality pretty quickly. And then I had to figure out in this fog that I was living in what the world was going to look like. And so all those thoughts about, you know, poor me existed. It was not able to exist very long because we were in the ICU and consistently we were being approached by families in the ICU and the kids in the bed next to me, right? Just saying, we're so sorry for what happened to you. We're so sorry for what happened to you. What can we do to help? And then we come to find out that their kid's laying in a hospital bed next to me with a terminal illness and doesn't know if they're going to live for another 30 days. Perspective hits in pretty hard when, when you realize that, even at seven. You know, other than not knowing at that moment whether or not I'd have use of my arm or if it would be successfully reattached, still in those first few weeks, I had no idea, right? The journey was so long beyond that. We had hope. But what I knew is that my life wasn't in jeopardy. And so no matter what, it was one of those things that I had to pause. And the core lesson really is that I learned early not to get stuck by the things that have happened to me, but instead get moved by the things I can do with them. And what I've learned in all my time of doing this as well is that moved people move people. And that's why we're on a mission to impact a billion lives as quickly as possible. For us, that means reducing the level of suffering that exists on this planet, because I believe so much of the suffering exists internal. I believe that we have the opportunity to be able to allow people to understand how they can get moved by the power of their stories, their experiences, and their healing if they put themselves into that position. And so for me, it, it movement is everything. And that's why we just asked for all the help we can get, because the only way we get to a billion lives is collectively. And it's helping more people move more people. And I think the more people are moving in the same direction around this idea of human connection and being our authentic selves without armor, shields, and living vulnerably, I think the more we all have an opportunity to stand on our own two feet, not just confident, but convicted in who we are, knowing that we've built a world that will not only accept us, but embrace us for who we are. That's the kind of world I want to build for my kids and my grandkids. And so I'm doing everything I possibly can intentionally to influence the trajectory of that in our world, because I also know what true freedom looks like and all the joy, freedom, and feeling that can come through it. And I know what it's like to be stuck. And because I know both perspectives in the depths of my soul, I want everybody to live over here. Everybody experiences and has the opportunity to experience abundance and endless joy, freedom, and fulfillment of being aligned wholly with who you are, who you're doing this for, who you're doing this with, and who you're going to impact. That's what this is all about, bro. I'll fill in the gap. I, I know some more information that happened here, but in between seven-year-old Brian in the, the truck accident and now this goal to impact one billion lives, there's another storyline that we haven't quite covered yet. So I'm yep. going to fast forward to your 20s. And you are working in a risk management and insurance brokerage firm. You're selling employee benefits. I couldn't really pin down how many people you launched this, this firm with, but you ended up growing this to a $15 million risk management firm. Pretty successful by all of the stereotypical me measures. And at 27, you look up and you find that you have the money you desired, the car that you wanted, the house that, that you always wanted, but it still wasn't what you really wanted to be. And then, of course, your wife and you have a really timely conversation, a really enlightening conversation after a weekend getaway. Can you pick up the story and, and kind of fill in the gap from there? Yeah, there's, you know, there's a few years between my aha moment and when we actually had that getaway. And so I'll just I'll fill in the gap there. But yeah, you know, I mean, I came out of college, bright eyed, bushy tailed. I wanted to take over the world, right? I wanted to climb the corporate ladder and have success based on the way the world had defined it. You know, I talk about this a lot from the perspective of like, I chased the what. So I really knew the what, right? I knew it all. I, what house, what car, what amount of money, what like my lifestyle, what zip code, what everything, right? It was all there. And with intentionality, I sought it all. And by the time I was 27, I had everything I had ever sought and desired externally from a material standpoint. And I want to be really clear. That's, this is not me saying this to impress. It's saying me to impress on the point because what it cost me was the ultimate price, who I was. That's the truth. I woke up and I all of a sudden looked around, running in circles with people making multiple six figures, seven figures, eight figures, realizing that I was empty, that I was lost, that I wasn't deeply connected, and that everything I actually wanted was right in front of me, yet I was not actually bringing it closer to me. I was pushing it further away. And so I had to go on this process of really understanding the pains that I still needed to heal so that I could shed the associated layers of armor that were existing to protect me from the self that I was afraid to turn into. I was existing in that bucket in who the world told me who to be based on all the narratives of the world from the time I could remember. And then so many situations where people didn't believe my story because it was too audacious. 
And so I'm now in this position at 27 years old, trying to unwind all these patterns that have developed and created in my life because I was afraid that the damage I had started to create was going to be way too great to repair. That's when I hired my first coach. And I hired my first coach right around this time because I also had a son. I missed the first six months of his life. And I always said, and you heard me say it earlier, that husband and fathers went in one role. I always said that everything I was going to do was better for my family. Guess what? I provided everything for my family except my presence. <laughs> I missed six months of his life other than the first week that I took off. And that was not intentional. That was blind because of a pattern I'd fallen into. I was burning the candle at both ends. And I was fortunate enough to have a, a moment to see the path I was on. And that's when I sought out help because I didn't have the people in my life. I didn't have the skill set. I didn't have the intellect. I didn't have the tools to be able to figure this out. So I heard my first coach and a month into working with me, he said, Brian, you got to be doing this. So what are you talking about? He goes, Brian, you build people, you build businesses. He's like, why are you not getting compensated for it? And I was like, oh man, because it's not about me. I mean, I'm trying to help all these. He's like, no, no, no. He's like, Brian, this is what you do. Why are you not doing this? And I said, yeah, yeah, whatever, buddy. I'm paying you a lot of money. Not tell me how great I am, but tell me to figure out this other stuff. Right? So for nine months, he trickled it. And then I jumped in with both feet and launched my coaching and speaking company. And I ran that side by side for about five years. And it was around that time, it was 2019, that my wife came to me. I had some other health stuff that took place. We did have this magical weekend, which by the way, we just revisited that same location that we went to in 2019. Oh, cool. Two weeks ago. And it was like a beautiful full circle moment. Mm. Yeah. Wh where was it? It's called Savannah Wellness Resort. It's up in Cave Creek, Arizona. And it's just a really incredible, quaint, removed place. And they do sound healing and myofascial release and aerial yoga and like all these things that are included in the overall process of like their experience. And so we went in 2019 and, you know, she gave me a truth moment. She told me after that session, when she asked me how it feels if I went to the office on Monday morning, that she felt like I'd allowed fear to enter in my world in a way she'd never seen me operate. Mm. She felt like I had convinced myself that we needed the status, the money and the prestige of this firm that we'd built that was still growing by double digits. And that she ultimately thought that I was hiding in a lot of ways. She felt like I didn't see the fact that I was barely scratching the surface of my potential, nor was I having the impact on the world that I wanted. And, you know, the most important thing is she said, I don't really care about any of the material things. I don't care if we live in a cardboard box in the corner or we need is 100% of you. So despite the fact that I'd raised all these levels of awareness and intentionality to get back to the core of who I was, I still wasn't living to the core of who I was because there was still some unhealed pain and some undealt with layers that I needed to still go through. But as I was swirling in my shame, flooded in my fear, drowning in my doubt in that moment, it allowed me to actually see what I needed to focus on. And so that's what I did for the next three months. I just spent a lot of intentional time really making sure that I understood what was keeping me stuck there. But that's ultimately when we leapt out and, and left. You know, it was shame primarily that kept me in that space. Shame that was deeply embedded in a whole variety of ways. And it's not so much the primary narrative, which is I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough. It's the secondary one that I credit Brene Brown for understanding. It's when you shut that down, you show up in the arena, you're ready to go to battle. It's who do you think you are? You see, everything major I ever did in my life up until that point, even though everything I had and I wanted by the time I was 27, I also felt the need to apologize for all of it. Every single time I had greater levels of success, I lived bigger, I did more, I felt the need to pull the throttle back in my life because I felt like the bigger I lived, the worse I was making other people feel. Really? And so there was lots of these elements that were really embedded that I had to unpack and really understand like where shame was actually showing up in my life, how I was moving in my body, how I was moving in my world so that I could move through it because it was truly something that impacted my relationship with my wife and kids, my business relationships, my ability to give and receive money and to be able to amplify everything we were doing. So despite high levels of success already to this point, I was limited inherently because of the shame filter that I viewed the world. And so that was really the beginning process of me starting to understand that the closer I can get to the core of who I am and the more I can live in alignment and congruency with who I am, the more all the what's in my world become a manifestation of who I am versus chasing the what's and losing the who. You can actually have both. You can be deeply aligned and connected with who you are. And if you are doing that, you will not only influence a greater amount of impact and those people in your life and with whom you're going to impact, but as a result of being aligned and congruent, you also don't have as much resistance and energy and you don't have as much interference and you have the ability to receive at an even greater level. And so all the what's become a byproduct of the who. It's a completely different game. And that's something that I wished I would have understood and would have been taught but frankly, our society isn't built to endure and support that type of education to support individuals. The reality of it is, is we want everybody to go down the path of who the world has told them who to be so that the rest of us can feel safe. Things that are different, things that are unique, things that are authentic often create threat for many people who aren't secure in who they are. So there's all these dynamics of the way shame and toxicity and the word should 
impact and limit the way that we can live as people. And it was all these dynamics, brother, that like truly have put me into this absolute place of clarity. Because again, the other parts that you didn't quite get to, and we won't hit on in depth in the moment unless we decide to, but as I unpacked my shame, I started to understand the deeper levels of anger that existed within me that I didn't even know were there. I started to realize the impact I was having on my wife and my kids. And truly the damage was even far greater than I imagined when we originally started talking about this. And so again, I had to shore up my own foundation if there's any chance of creating leverage and scale to create the perpetual impact of a billion lives. So for me, I'm a big believer that everything begins and ends with you. As one of my friends, Alex Sharfin, often says, if you're constantly putting out fires in your life and your business, there's a good chance you're the arsonist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of my favorite quotes that I feel like you requote very often in different podcasts. It just sinks in. And to circle back on the shoulds too, and, and we've talked about this a few times on the podcast as well, should is a shame-based word. And instead of should, think woulds and coulds. So hopefully that kind of closes the loop on that. But let's go to the anger aspect. You brought it up. I was very surprised whenever I heard you talk about this. You had to overcome anger and there was a lot of unraveling there. Can you expand on that? Share a little bit more in that space? Yeah, absolutely. You know, this was like last March and April. So 2021, you know, I walked away from risk management and play benefits consulting to help people discover who they are, who they're doing this for, who they're doing this with and who they're going to impact. And last March created a pattern of events that unwound a space for my wife to articulate to me with absolute clarity and conviction that there were ways that I'd shown up in our marriage. There were things that I had contributed and created towards a pattern in our relationship that had all compounded to her losing who she was. That was a soul hit. Mm. The singular person and soul that I care most about on this planet, other than myself, was telling me that I was responsible or at least significantly influencing her ability to lose who she was, despite the fact that I'm helping the world discover who they are. That gave me enough reason to pause just in and of itself, but it's put us into a pattern over the next six weeks to really kind of unpack it a little bit further. And it became very, very clear that I was dealing with a deep, dark, hidden level of anger. You've probably heard me say this as well. It was buried so deep, it could barely be excavated. I didn't even know it was there, right? Despite her attempts to bring it to my awareness multiple times, but it didn't show up anywhere else in my world. And so it wasn't something that was prevalent. And in fact, when I went out and I started talking about this and I started owning it, even with some of our closer relationships that I would have figured would have experienced it the same way that she did, almost all of them were like, wait, what? You're angry? I had contained it so tight that the only people that really saw it were those closest to me. Hmm. I didn't see it. I didn't allow myself to see it because it wasn't aligned with who I was, which meant that it also tapped my shame even more. But what's funny is anger is a secondary emotion and mine was a byproduct of my shame, but my anger also triggered my shame. So it was this crazy cyclical loop that I had to really get clear on and understand. But when this happened, I handed my, my wife my phone and I said, I need you to clear my calendar for the next 10 days. I need you to keep my phone for the next 10 days. I don't want any external communication with anybody because I have to go through my own inside out methodology to really understand where this anger came from, right? I had to apply what I knew I do for others and I've done for myself with helping awareness and ownership and getting to the root and being able to move through my emotion in a deep level. I made a promise to her that day that I was going to do everything in my power to ensure that the negative effects of anger would not impact our household as a result of me again. Knowing that I could not promise that it wouldn't happen, but that I could do everything in my power. And I also committed to her that at that moment, I was going to do everything in my power to also pay attention to and break the generational patterns of which I probably continued and passed on to my kids. I'm very proud to say that 18 months later, the negative effect of anger has only happened in our house as a result of me three times. Yeah. I had to get really, really clear on where and how this all took place. And, you know, though I don't always talk about the roots of my shame and my anger in, in external faces, because I believe that so many of those are mine and that is one of the areas that I will protect. That's my information. I can share some of them. You know, one of them was very clear because a few days after this took place, I witnessed a pedestrian accident where I watched a kid get run over by a car. This was three days after I discovered my anger. And I went into a complete panic attack while I was driving because the amount of information I received simultaneously in that moment from the entire environment, from every person that I was around, from the individual on the ground, the parents, everything, as well as me receiving my own information, I saw images of my own experience that I'd never seen before until last summer. They were locked and hidden so far and deep away in my brain that I hadn't seen them. I hadn't experienced them. I hadn't understood it. 
And so I got home in the five minutes and I literally just was in the fetal position and hyperventilating in tears for the better part of an hour without my ability to even tell my wife what was happening. I could not calm myself down. It was a complete panic attack. But it was also a gift because it gave me a pathway and an opening to really understand some of the areas that I was angry about. And it allowed me to understand some of the disconnections I have with my own physical body, the lack of trust I've had, the anger that I've actually had around the pain that I experience on a regular and consistent basis. The fact that I sometimes need to have, in fact, often a two hour morning routine just to get myself up and moving in the morning. I was carrying resentment, frustration around, despite the fact that I am here, I am living and I am a happy, healthy and productive human being. And so understanding all these dynamics, it was important for me to see some of those roots that I could start to move through it. But really, then it really got down to understanding with a high level of awareness, how anger was moving through my body right? Not just the root or root source or source of that emotion, but like, how is it actually moving? Because anger moves through my body differently, just like shame does, right? And then I had to understand where are all the places that I'm getting triggered, right? And when I say triggered, that doesn't even mean it's legitimate because often when I say trigger, it's those unhealed, unprocessed emotions or situations in our lives that trigger us and transport us back to a place that isn't from this current moment. So when I say triggered, it's not even a negative. It could literally have been my son jumping on me with love, but I'm on sensory overload or the dogs barking or any number of things. I had to start to understand what are these things that I'm getting triggered by so that I could actually challenge the intellectual and emotional narrative around each one of those situations to see is what I'm reacting to actually correct to this moment or is it a conditioned embedded behavioral pattern because of this trigger from so long ago. When I can start to slow myself down long enough to pause just to ask myself an additional question, take a breath or reframe a scenario, Often what I was finding is that I was reacting more than I was responding. When I was reacting, I was creating damage. And now that I have the ability to respond, there's no need to repair. But it also means better communication, better connection, better established trust all the way around, more ability to be even vulnerable and courageous in my own self, which leads to a deeper level of intimacy in every relationship that you exist with. And I don't just mean that sexually. I mean that legitimately. Like your connection improves when you actually understand how to drop the armor and heal yourself by allowing yourself to feel long enough in order to heal. That's what the process looked like. I had to put myself into some dark places to really understand what I could extract from it and how do I move forward? Because I wasn't going to allow myself to be confined by the demons of my past just because I was stuck in these patterns. And so anger was really real. And it's something that I'm actually really, like this is probably the most profound movement I've made in my life is the ability to put myself into a place where I don't feel the anger emotion hardly ever. What's crazy is I get triggered by shame still frequently. That doesn't mean I live and exist there, but I get triggered by my shame often. But what I can tell you is that I do believe that because anger is a secondary emotion, it's one that I could dispel and diffuse a lot more effectively. And it's allowed me to really recognize that in those moments, I've got way more influence and control than I ever thought. And my wife, not long ago, in a conversation for the first time, was actually amazed and impressed and said, I was conditioned and believed for so long that the only thing you could emote was anger. Yet she hasn't seen anger from me in months. And so it's something that I'm very proud of and also ties us back full circle to the intentionality of my son. Had I not been able to dispel this, diffuse this, understand this, move through this, I wouldn't have the relationship with my son that I just described earlier. Brian, I think that's an amazing place to wrap up our conversation. I have been really touched in multiple different ways through this conversation today. The intentionality, of course, one of them. So thank you so much for jumping in and providing so much insight and wisdom, especially on a day where you're struggling with some loss too. Thank you. Thank you for, for the chance to, to comment. I just found out news last night from a good friend of mine that I actually met through the hospital. We spent a lot of time developing philanthropic programs and co-led a group that we raised multiple six figures and gave a bunch of grant cycles back to the hospital. Just an incredible human being. He lost his battle with life yesterday. I don't know all the details yet, but you know, he's one that showed up every day fighting for others. He showed up every day trying to shine his light and show others what's possible through his own struggles and adversity. And, you know, he's now on a, on a short list of individuals that are motivation for me every single day. And so I couldn't, I couldn't think of a, a better way to honor him than to be present and honor the universe and the connection and the conversation that we were going to have today. Because just like he, I mean, he was a living example of not getting stuck by the things that happened, but getting moved by what you could do with them. And he showed people that every day. Well, you're definitely honoring him. And 
it's an honor to be one of your 1 billion too um, that you have gone on and affected. And if people are interested, they really resonated with something you said today, where's a good place to get connected, learn a little bit more? I think you you have something to share with, with the audience today. I do. Go to nolimitspreludes.com. It is a free course that we have made available after a long time of investing into a bunch of different resources. It's got over 30 minutes of video content and gets you through the first chapter of our entire course that we guide all of our group coaching programs and one-to-one coaching programs through. But I give a caveat. Yes, I get an email in exchange for getting access to it. Yes, you'll get a couple of emails through your course of completing it. And yes, you'll get four emails at the end outlining opportunities to engage further. But like I've said from the beginning, my goal is not to get you or convince you or to persuade you into being in our world. My hope is that you'll invest in yourself, whether it's with us or someone else. But if something moved you, I just ask for your help in moving it through the world whether or not you engage with us formally, because that is how we create this impact. If you want to follow on social, I'm at Bogart Brian on any channel, and uh, we truly want to help and create impact wherever possible. So let us know how. Brian, my final question for you. I think you know it's coming. If you had the opportunity to teach a 16-week course to a group of graduating college seniors on a topic that isn't normally covered in the classroom, what would you teach and how would you teach it? How to turn up the volume on your inner voice and block out the external noise. Mm, Tell me more. I would work with all of these individuals to really understand where and how they can raise their levels of awareness in the current period, where and how they can unpattern and unwind the things that have been conditioned into them through the formal educational system, through the ways that we've been struck, constructed as a, as a society, and to really allow them to lean into who they are in their authentic voice, whether or not they can live in that moment professionally, or at least just allow themselves to further align and give themselves permission to say and feel and do the things that are necessary. I often believe that the sources of suffering are the things that are left unsaid, the things that we lack permission to feel or say, the things we lack permission to do, or the things that are left undone. And so I would give a space for each one of these individuals to understand with absolute clarity who they are, who they're planning to impact, and the work that needs to be done to heal the pains of their past and shed the layers so they can be free moving forward. Because if they live in alignment with who they are, if they can perpetuate and understand that their internal voice is their barometer, not the external one, if they can put themselves in a position where their internal voice can raise their level of awareness without also simultaneously raising the level of judgment they have for themselves, but allow themselves to see themselves as objective and future focused, then we're creating a world where so many people can create pathways to connect with each other. And I would show them the way to get back to who they are. Brian Bogart, man. What a fun conversation. Check them out on social, guys. Go check out that course if that's something that you're interested in. Brian, thank you so much for coming on and and sharing time with me today. Thank you for building a platform for me to pour good into the world, brother. Thanks for tuning into the episode. Here's what you can expect next on The Struggle is Real. There have been some periods in stock market history where you could very easily put this steady drip of money into your investing account buy some diversified, let's say S&P fund, and five years later, have less money than you put in. Even 10 years later, have less money than you put in. The stock market has had 10 year periods of real negative return. But when you zoom out to that 15, 20, 30 year timeline, that's where you start to see this thing called reversion to the mean, where very bad periods often revert to the mean and, and are followed by quite a good period. What we might be seeing here in 2022 is a very long, good period from 2012, roughly, until 2021, is now reverting back to the mean of around uh, 10% return per year. That's been the long-term average of the S&P 500. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you like this conversation today, be sure to subscribe so you'll be notified about new episodes. If you want to connect with me, send me a message on Instagram. I'm at Justin Lee Peters. You can find show notes with links to everything we discussed today at justinpeters.co. I'm your host, Justin Peters. Thanks for tuning in.